Good day everyone. Uh, today I'm going to speak with you about physical properties of optically active compounds. So these are going to be um, very much physical properties which um, sort of characterize particular stereospecific isomers, um, whether they be one configuration or another, as well as telling whether something is uh, an inactive, optically inactive environment where um, you know two sort of influences will cancel one another out. So you can kind of think of how we've um, kind of already discussed some R and S mixtures. So let's say uh, we have one here that's fluorine, methyl, It's just a methyl group and then it's just simply hydrogen right there. We know that mirror image is going to be the enantiomer because <clears throat> you're just changing one particular stereo center here. Okay. So in other words, you're going to have an inversion of configuration. Okay. So what that means is, so if we we're going to look, go for highest to lowest priority, it's going to go one, two, three, so that's going to be S. And this is going to be R. Now these are going to bend uh, light in their own particular way. So let's say if you had a racemic mixture, meaning one to one of these, um, and if you they were in fact 50-50 in terms of count of left to right, um, you are going to have <coughs> an octively, octave, optically inactive um, analyte, right? So if you had just a pure one, then you would see that it would bend off from zero degrees, you know, either left or to the right, so much of an amount. Um, but the S to the R should be equal in magnitude, whether it's bending light in one direction versus another. So plane polarized, polarized light is simply um, a phenomenon where you see light sort of bend off into an angle. So this is kind of like how your sunglasses will work, right? So you can not, you know, stare straight into the sun uh, with the eye, with uh, with some sunglasses, but you know, you can look at, you can bear uh, some glare that's, you know, flashing off of uh, certain or reflecting off certain uh, surfaces, etc. Right. Um, <clears throat> So that's going to filter out most of the high energy photons there that would just otherwise kind of pass through and uh, damage your eye sight. So, um, so that's an example of polarizing light. Um, now, with these particular uh, compounds, again, one specific enantiomer is going to have, if it were pure, that would be something that you would report just like uh, anything you would say see um, in a particular publication so it's almost like a melting point or boiling point or something like that it's an intrinsic property okay so one last thing um, to think about here is that if you were to let's say synthesize these and you wanted to get them in antimerically pure you would use some kind of chiral stationary phase so uh, using column chromatography. So chromatography, if you're not familiar, is just some stationary phase, some stuff that's uh, going to be dissolved in a solvent is going to pass through. And depending on how well that can retain to whatever type of uh, stationary medium is there, not react with it per se, but actually uh, interact with it through intermolecular forces, depending on how polar or nonpolar things are. Things will retain at a uh, or retain or elute out. Okay, so uh, typically, you know, your silica dioxide, which is not chiral at all, is going to be um, your medium for a stationary phase. So something that's going to be a lot more expensive than sugar base and actually have, you know, um, a particular type of um, <clears throat> configuration to it is going to hold, you know, an S molecule from an R molecule. Because these are both are going to have the same polarity, right? You're going to have this general um, 
dipole moment sticking up towards where that carbon is. Okay, so let's uh, go over some basics here, kind of give you some more definitions to work with. So for in terms of chiral environments, you can think of uh, a chiral catalyst, so it's going to certain uh, place, let's say, hydrogens onto one particular alkene that's sticking on one side as opposed to another. Um, enzymes, which are definitely going to be um, specific or stereospecific with sort of a lock and key or glove sort of mechanism holding on to a particular substrate. And then chiral chromatography is just discussed. Okay, so while the actual um, solvent will not be uh, stereospecific, the analyte will. Okay, so the same thing is going to go or happen with um, reading specific rotation. Again, that's a particular degree sign um, left or right of zero to where this is going to bend light, something that's optically active. Okay, so um, sometimes you'll actually see where things aren't racemic and you'll have a little bit more of one enantiomer over the other. Um, <clears throat> you can refer to problem 5.28 in your text. Uh, we can go over that during office hours if you wish. But uh, this is going to be a pretty short and sweet uh, module. Um, there, this is really just sort of... Uh, kind of a segue into some of the things that we're going to start to look at in terms of stereo specificity and, and trying to determine what kind of product you're going to get. So oftentimes if you don't have any stereo specificity at all, that means it's usually going to be an intumeric mixture, or in other words, a racemic mixture, and you're not going to see uh, anything in terms of a specific rotation or um, optical rotation, you're going to see something directly at zero degrees. Okay, so in other words, one's going to be canceling out, like I said, the other out, like I said. Um, but we will go over. Um, oh, wanted to give you one particular example. So ibuprofen is in one type of configuration. Okay, so for the R, for the uh, <clears throat> R ibuprofen, that's going to be at negative 54.5 degrees. So that's 54.5 degrees um, to, let's say, either the right or left in this case. Maybe it would be right uh, from zero degrees. And then its S configuration is going to be exactly positive 54.5 degrees. Okay, so um, just, I know this is not going to be earth shattering information to some of you, but uh, it's nonetheless good information to know about this particular uh, subject matter because um, this is actually one of the main ways these kinds of measurements of a pure compound are going to uh, tell you a lot more in terms of whether or not it's actually going to have optical activity through rotation um, of light. So you're, you know, it's not going to be the tell all, um, end all, be all of what kind of information you're going to need out of a molecule. We're going to later look into things like spectroscopy that are going to tell us a lot more about connectivity and and as well as what is uh, part of the molecule itself. All right, so this one was going to be short and sweet, like I intended. Um, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks.